And so therefore, guess what we did? We ripped, we kept blokes go to the end of the line and just switch off. Now all of a sudden they're starting to watch. And so therefore now, so guess who we're starting to get buy-in? We're starting to get people to start to think about an ownership in that way because we're starting to build it up as the norm in that way. I'm going to come and you've got a question, but I won't miss you, don't worry. Now, but here's where we keep going. So we start to do that and we go out and we get the drill and we're coming back. But each time we're doing it, as somebody starts to add, as people have just told me, we start to live where we're going. But now here's the critical component. Guess what? While the drill's going on, I go up to somebody and say, when I blow the whistle and come in, you're coach. Ah! <laughs> what do you mean? You'll be the one out the front. <laughs> what am I going to do? You've got the easy bit. You're going to go and say, give me something we're doing well. Give me something we could do better. Give me something else. See, we'll, see, we'll give them the tools. So now what happens is, I blow the whistle. Only that person knows. As everybody now comes in, all of a sudden, that person's standing in front. Do you think I stand beside him or behind him? No. No, why? You want to be around. I've just it. taken away, haven't I? So I go with the rest of the group and watch him and he now does it. So you can imagine, guess what? That's okay if your better players do it, but imagine if you get that shy kid to do it. And now he's actually doing it. Who's he? What's he now? He's a leader. He's now, and all of a sudden, guess what he finds? Hey, I can do this. But more importantly, what are we telling the whole group? Everybody can be a leader. And so we're starting to send the message and sell the message every in that situation. And so we start to build up. But guess what? It's non-threatening. And I can tell you right now that I've taken junior footy kids and in one night started out and, set and got them to do this situation. By the end of the night, they were jumping out of their skin because they loved it. Because then you have other variations. Because the other variation can be, as we're going on, you might say to somebody, OK, pair off and get a partner. And that person gets a partner. What I'm going to do now is that we're going to do this next drill. And I'll go through and ask, give me something we can do, etc., etc. Okay, fantastic. Now I want you to go out and do the drill, but don't see your partner. I want you to watch what they're doing. In the course of you doing the drill properly, I want you, I don't care if you're at one end of the ground, the person on the ground, keep an eye on him, because when I blow the whistle and come in, you're going to each other are going to review each other's performance. <coughs> How are we going to do that? You're going to say, give me something you did well. <laughs> Give me something you could have done better. Give me something you did it next time, etc. And then say, you notice this. So you can see now all of a sudden we're starting to develop that leadership in that thing. So guess what? <coughs> I can have I can have a two game player with a one game player. It doesn't matter. So we're in that situation, we're all getting to start that build up. So now we start to develop even more. Did I cover that question? Do you want to go on? No, you did. I yes. was just going to ask before you finished it, the week you actually answered it was, wouldn't you pick out a person in your team that will know that answer that you're going to ask first? Yeah. Rather than going to someone and saying, well, what do we do? No. I don't know. No. no you know why? Because sort of, yeah. they, they will see it. Yeah. They will know it. And that, and that situation, but then again, the, but the most powerful one again is when we get somebody out the front. Now, I'm going to tell you the byproduct of training at this. Once we've got that, and if you've got, for heaven's sake, can I just say this again? Be students and not followers. I'm just saying that you come up with your one by which you do it. But can you imagine now, and I, and I started doing this with the under 14 and I start off by saying, I've got 28 kids coming to training, how in the hell am I going to do it? I, 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 the dads and that, they turn up now and again. Where am I going to get, geez, I'd love to be at Colin. Colin's got 12 assistant coaches, how good it would be? Well, guess what, how many assistant coaches do you work with? 28. Because we could all do that. So now instead of ha just having one drill where I have to oversee, guess what? I could have as many drills as I wanted to. Because I'd say, okay, I want you tall guys to go over and do this, Julie, the other guys to go there, so we can have over the roof place all the different places. Now, before you do the exercise, you know what you do, don't you? You know your little drill you're going to do? You're going to drill? Yes, you do. So what do you do? Yeah, we do. Give me something we're going to do in this drill. 
And so all of a sudden you look out and there's a drill going there, drill going there, and all I've got to do is I just walk over and I just listen. And, it, and, and what they do is once they've gone for a few minutes, they stop and they do it again. So therefore we're now setting that little scene to, that goes in that, that situation. So we've got that happening. That licence to take the time to answer the question is a really important component of that. It's, it, it's, it's, we're talking about quality versus quantity. And more importantly, as I said, you know, versus the other way, there's that tendency to jump in too often and, and stop the drill to try and fix some, somebody up in that situation. Or there's a tendency to let it go and it festers too long and they can do it. But once we've got them thinking and taking ownership and then sharing that type of situation, we've started to develop that. The great thing I found was from my point of view is that what happens, guess what, I'm now delegating. So I can get the drill. So guess what, if I see a kid who is the only one in the drill who's struggling with it, I can actually go and take him aside and not stop everybody else doing what needs to be done and spend some quality time with him. To give him that stuff without everybody having to stand around and wasting all this time or I'm just going on one person or stopping the drill for it. So we've now developed that in that, that situation. So we've got that, that, as I said, that feeling coming through that needs to be done. Okay, so what happens from that point of view? All right, so we get on game day. So on game day, what happens is, again, uh, what I found is that we come in, and this is a critical thing, I used to see some coaches, and it doesn't matter who's, I'd come in, and here we'd be, and they'd have this whiteboard, and there'd be 397,000 things written on it. <laughs> now, fair dinkum, anybody who's ever sat there and think you absorb one section of that, I'll go we. <laughs> I was told emphatically by somebody in the Victorian sport, any more than three messages is overload. As a matter of fact, very few will remember any of the three you say. It is not the time to do it. So what are we going to do? Well, we thought about it, and for us, what we found is there are certain things that need to be done from a team perspective in our down there, but the most critical thing is that in our game, there are teams within teams. And the teams within teams are virtually backs, forwards, and on ballers. And so what happened is, before a game, I might come up and I might have these are the three things we're going to do this day. Because we've, we've talked about during the week, we've done our training, these are the things I want you to do. Okay, break off in your teams. So in the teams go into, so the backs go up in their one little area, the forwards go there, so the on boards go in that other area. Some might have to scoot around a little bit. So as they get there, but what are we talking about? <laughs> what's, our, what's our leadership? What's this got to do? How, how do we go about this weekend? Aha, uh -huh, pretty easy. Because guess what we got? And, on, and what we had was we had a big thing listed up. And up there, guess what it had? Just a blow up of that. And if you play in those positions, these are the key things that you need to do. So, all right, so we've got the backs. I'll just use the backs. There's six backs there. So they've got down, they say, well, we've got these things to do. Who's going to be responsible for that one? I'll take responsibility for that one. I'll take responsibility for that one. The maximum they ever got was two. Two areas of responsibility in that situation. And one guy might see, get the matchups right, um, in other words, and the next one might be um, uh, work off them and switch. I'll be responsible for that this thing. So all they do is they talk and they share those things because one person out there in the back line of the six, I, I don't want one captain. I, I want six captains. Now some are going to be better at it than others. But I want to make sure we're involved. So therefore, as we're now going out, we, t we talk about it, we go out, while the game's there, so much of what needs to be done happens when the ball's up the other end of the ground. It's about getting organised. So if I'm here now, I'm now looking out and I'm saying, Jack, you get on him, move over, get the matchups right. So I'm doing that. So I'm talking to other people and the people are responding, because that's the thing we've got. So now we've got, we're working on the leadership side of it. Same for the other areas, so we talk about it. So it comes quarter time, and this was a massive breakthrough, and I'm, I'm not, I'm, I need to say this because it's true, most of that stuff come when we talked about it at the AFL level, this is what the players told me they were comfortable with. So they came up with it. But the important thing is that if I'm going to give leadership and I want to create a leadership environment in my club, what I mustn't do is give a little bit of leadership and then not, and then take it away at the same time. So the critical component was we changed what happened in the AFL. And it happened in 1995. And what was that? 
that major change was in 1995, if you looked at a game of footy in the AFL and you walked down, what you would have seen up until that point of time is a coach standing with 22 odd people there talking to them and somebody on the whiteboard and he's talking, he's going through the whole group. But if you looked at St Kilda in 1995, as you walked down, what you would have seen was what? Three groups. A lot of people started to mimic it, but the difference was, as I had the whiteboard with the team setups, in that situation, my backs, I'll just use the backs for example, guess what the backs were saying amongst themselves? What are we doing right? And the person who's talking about, well, I reckon we got the matchups right, we've got so-and-so's right, okay, what do you think we could have done better? Do, 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 what do you believe we now need to do? So they're talking amongst themselves because that's the stuff that they've just, they're conditioned to do. There's leadership. My assistant coaches at that point of time, who on those line coaches, they came down, you know their first thought? Listen. Don't walk down and straight away start telling because what have we just destroyed? We destroyed the trust and, and that and everything we talked about. Listen to it and if they've covered all the things that you've talked about and we've talked about, that's fine. Or you may need to say, guys, that's terrific, but what about? We can always add that bit in. But we've made sure we've gone through in that way, in that, that area. Now, if there's something that they're unsure about, you can have the answer or you may need to come to me. And my, my role really then is to look at how do I want the team to be set up and do, or if I need to go and speak to one or two people, I can do it without the whole group. So, so that groups are doing. So that happens now at, uh, at quarter time, half time, three quarter time, and more importantly now the end of the game. And end of the game was the biggest challenge for me. Because the end of the game was more of me wanting to take control and the tendency that when you won a game, you gloss over everything. And when you've lost a game, you get too bloody analytical on everything. And now, again, the players said to me, Stan, before you say to us after a game, allow us to do the review and present. So after a game, those backs, forwards on ballers got together and they talked about it and they picked somebody out of their group for that day and that person came in front, in front of the whole team said, I represent the forwards today, these are the things we think we did well. This, this, this and this. These are the things we think we could have done better. Du, du, du. And these are the things we think, believe we need to do. In other words, concentrate on training this week, etc, etc, in that way. And so I listen to that, and then it's my turn. And guess what? Rarely had anything to say. As a matter of fact, I heard stuff I didn't know. See, so sitting up in a coach's box, you've got all the stuff, you do not know what's, in my words, happening in the heat of battle. It's only when you hear certain things that are going on out there and you go, wow. But the critical thing about that is that when we walked out of a team meeting and they made a decision, where is now the focus? What do we need to do? And so therefore, and guess what then led into training, then into the other areas. Yep. Did you do a review with your own coaching staff as well? Most definitely. Doing the same? Most definitely. Then would you get up and present that to the playing group? Nope. No. No. Just, just no. Internal. No. Just internally in that situation. I might come and deliver, say to it later on, but that was that was the stuff that we needed, we wanted to do. And what we found really, um, from our point of view was that it was far better up for us not to do it on the day. It was far better for us to, to, to take some time and think about it. And the reason is because we felt amongst ourselves that as coaches, we got, we got too emotional because we can't let go of the, the physical side of it. We just needed to calm down a fraction and do that. But also we wanted to hear things that those players said before, before we did it. But I said that, that, but that's again, that's be a student, not a follow-on. That's the preference of the group, and it's also your timing and your other commitments and stuff like that. But we found that we were far better from, from that point of view. So as I said, once, once we'd set that situation up and, and done that from that point of view, we did it matches, we did it uh, at, at breaks, we did it after the game, and then, as I said, the other things then that just led on. But the critical component i just come to say here is that what we're now doing is that, that leadership, and from that situation, the leadership started to evolve. And from that, what we found is that when there were people who, um, who became very good leaders, but they were very good leaders because they did it, but there are other good leaders who got the capacity of everybody else because they could actually say things. 
And we had some people in the group who were very good leaders, but they were bloody gung-ho. But there are other people who are really good because they had the capacity to say, just hang on before we do that, think this through. So we allowed the personalities of people to come through and just to develop that and evolve that situation. And the great thing about also that what we found is that as this started to go on, when we knew that environment was there, you don't have to have meetings. Because if somebody sees something, people are prepared to go up and talk about it in that way and talk amongst each other. At training sessions, you know, as the thing was going on and somebody <coughs> might see something come on, as a person came back and over there somebody say, see, you know, I reckon you did that well, but if you did this, we could do it better. And so they were just starting to build it, and now the ownership. Because we transferred what was happening off the ground into a game of capacity. And those people, we gave them the licence. And you'll see within, I guess, a lot of good clubs, they allow their players to make the moves and get the things. It might mean that you're watching it, you may change it, and they, they understand that, but we've given them the licence and that leadership to be able to do it. And once they just took that, from my point of view, and I said, I'm really just using the Mordialic Bracelet under 14s, but then the St Kilda experience to show you just ways and methods, but it can be done. But again, I'm going to reinforce this for, for questions. It takes a lot of planning beforehand. The time and effort to set it up and come up with the means and the methods by which being able to do it, and you've got a plan by which to work your people through, is far better than trying to do it on the run. Because do it on the run, you can be chopping and all over the place in that situation. So I just hope in that small period of time I've just sowed the seed of, of some ways this can be done. Um, and now really it's open to you in, in questions that you may have in those areas or any other thing before you want to jump in your chariots and, and head off home. If there's other areas that you want to cover, please take me there. Uh, I'm yours. I'd be interested to know, uh, Melbourne went through that little patch where they appointed quite, a, quite young, a young captain. Yep. What does that do to the group of players who would have regarded themselves as uh, more experienced or senior players? Uh, look, it really shouldn't matter, depending on the environment that you've set. <coughs> because if that person's the best person for the job, and it's done on that basis and there's a reason behind it, but my concern is that what happens is it it really, somebody just came in <coughs> and made that appointment before they'd really got trust and respect within the group. And that person only been in a few minutes and then somebody else comes in and they're all over the shop. Um, to, me, to, me, to me it was reactive and it wasn't, it wasn't something that had been thought through. That, they may be the best person for the job, but if there's not an understanding and people don't buy in in that way, I, I think they just, I just made a uh, terrible decision in the fact that they didn't have a, a process and a mechanism by which to work around. I mean, I, I'm open to other people's observations on it, if, if you want. But that was the thing that just got me, is that they just walked in and just went bang to these people. You know, it, it, even from the point of view what we did um, just on those, those situations, my leadership group, at St Kilda was that I asked the people to vote on who they wanted to be in the leadership. Everybody's going to be in it, but who's in the leadership group? Who do you want to be in that way? And, and that was because we just felt uh, that we really wanted some people, if the younger players wanted to go to advice, who do we go to and everything like that in that situation. And the reality is that they voted for, for a number of people, and then in that group I said, OK, of oh, that person, who do, you, who do you want to be the captain at this point of time? And um, first person to put his hand up was Robert Harvey said, not me. So he said, no, I'm, I'm, that's leadership. No, I'm not ready. You know, he said, because I don't feel I have the right to come and say something to somebody. I don't feel comfortable with that. I like to show it by my actions. And so we talked about, and then they picked two people. And they said, we can't split between Lowe and Burke. So we made them co-captains. But then the interesting thing is that next year when we looked at the group, what happened was, there's a person who wasn't ever thought of, was now said, we want this person in the leadership group. The whole thing, the, the whole playing group said, this guy should be in the leadership group. I said, why is that? And his name was Jamie Shanahan. And I said to them, well, why do you want him? And they said, well, because we believe he does so many of the things far better and his ability to be able to just see things clearly and talk to us is what we think we want. And so all of a sudden, Jamie jumped up in that, that, that area. But one of the things that we did is because we gave some measurements to them that happened about is that, you imagine, Jamie's full back, 
fullback in those days was probably more about stopping the opposition and not worrying about any kicks. Jamie would average about four or five um, kicks a game and stuff like that. So we just didn't think, well, he's not making an impression. But what we didn't realise is, remember I said those one percenters? And we wanted, as I said, 12, around about 12 per quarter, uh, per game, from a person to do that. So if we could get that in the game, that was fantastic. <coughs> but at the end of the year, when we totaled them up, Jamie Shanahan averaged 32 a game. So where do you think he's now seen in terms of by the guys? About his value to the team. Who does all the hard stuff? Who does the hard yanker? Who makes everybody else look good? And so all of a sudden, in their eyes, he was the leader in that area, and they wanted him in the group. But it didn't mean that we didn't do all these other different things, because people will still come at different levels, and you see them in different ways, but again, the, the, for me, the group was telling me, this is who we want to be at the top of our group. We're going to, everybody's going to be involved, we understand where we are, but these are the people in, from our point of view we went with. You know, I would doubt, um, if you ask the, the people at Melbourne in that period of time, were those people ready to do it, I, I'd suggest the answer is no, because they were too young, and they had a chance. They were thrown in the deep end, and all we saw was that they then wallowed in it. And I think they wallowed in it because I don't know what they were expected, what their measurements were. Any others? What style did Ron Barassi have at North Melbourne? Well, I think I think that Brass was different. Brass was caught. Brass was a very good move with the times, but he was really caught between the telling situation. But then. <coughs> I think that he started to mellow, uh, and I saw him mellow, and it was interesting because I had him for four years, three as a player and one as his runner, and when I first went there, my vision was every time I'd seen Brassy was ranting and raving and screaming and shouting, and I was a bit sort of in hesitation of this, but that was only about 5% of him. And so he, he was, you know, he was still, he was still get in your face and tell you, but his means of doing it, um, how can I give some examples? I'll give you two examples. The first time that I uh, met with Ron, um, and, I, and I was 31 years of age, so I'd come from Melbourne, you know, I've been captain and all those other things, and Ron said, I've got you across because I think you can really help us win a flag, and I'm going to do this by making you a better player. That was his words. And I went, oh, jeez, 31, you're going to make me a better player? He said, yep. And I said, and he said, but I need you to come and watch some vision, some video. So I came and sat with him and had some video. And I watched video for about 15 minutes. And I was involved in that video. And at the end of it, he said, okay, what do you think? And I'll tell you what my exact words were. I said, Ron, you're obviously a super coach, but you're a shit hours video operator. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, why? I said, I've just watched 15 minutes of video and not once in my time for the footy. And he said, no, that's where your problem lies. <laughs> I said, why? You know what he said to me? You're reactive. You're a fantastic player because of your talent and ability. You've been able to react to a situation and make the most of it. He said, mate, I'm telling you, those days of your physical attributes are waning but I'm going to make you a better player by teaching you to play ahead of the game. And I said, well, how am I going to do that? And he, I'll give you one example. He said, I'm now going to show you a bit of vision. And it was a vision of across the ground from me on a wing. So it was me there and the other side of the ground and the play was that way. And it was being kicked down into our defensive area on the defensive side. He said, what if you just snuck away a bit What's going on? Not too far, because if you go too far, what would happen? I said, oh, you'll see me, come. He said, so if you go, say, five, six, seven, ten metres, yeah, that's okay. He said, mate, quickest run in the world never catch over that thing. He said, if you, but if you do this, when we win the footy, between half back and back pocket, if we switch and you're our get out man, and you come and take the ball, and Rossi Henshaw was a great player, be able to switch the ball, he's a fantastic lace out, he said, if you do that and get the footy here, Steve and Nick come through on the inside and you give it to him, we can just break him up and catch him out the other way. I played three years, gone. And you know, I was averaging 25, 26 positions, but most of them were coming from there. And so, so just see how he went through, even at that, how he was in that way. And that, what was another one? He said to us one night, 
from now on, he said, for the next three weeks, I want you guys to watch TV Tuesday night at 9.30. Why? Channel 2. So why what's on? I'm telling you, 9.30, Channel 2, everybody watch. So you turn on the other ones, English soccer match of the day. He, just, he said, I want you to watch it. And then he, got, then he said, what does he notice about it? And what do we, no, we notice? Guess what? Switching of the ball in the back half. And so he said, you know what we're going to do at uh, Sunday morning training when we come down to train? Sunday mornings, we've always played Saturday in those days. We played soccer. And it was all switch, 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 switch. And then at training, he said, OK, now we're going to use footies. So rather than saying, this is what we're going to do, he got us to watch. He asked us. Then he said, train, train with soccer balls. So the method in his madness again, even at that point of time that he wasn't at the level that we're probably talking at, but he was letting go. He was doing those things and he had that. And probably it was only at that time when I got there that I started to have my, my desire to want to coach. Came about by, by just watching how he went about things and did that. As I said, it's still a hard task, Mark, because he hadn't totally let go, <laughs> but, but all the seeds were there. But this is what he did, and his capacity then to be able to get, you know, really good players to play together in a team and get that outcome, I thought was fantastic. Do, do you think AFL will become more kamikaze in the long run than structures, for the fact of obviously more video and that to shut things down? Will it become more kamikaze than I structures? I'd love to be able to answer this, but I don't know. Because I think the evolution is just going so much and so much in that period of time. Um, I've got to tell you, from a, a person outside watching the game, I dislike what I see. And I, and I say that to, to each and everybody because I think one of the problems that I've got at the moment is that we're probably coming too structured. And so much of that structure is based on people who had the right intentions early to go and watch other sports. But we took so much of other sports into our sport that perhaps we were losing what was great about our sport. Um, and because our sport is played on different size arenas and different things and stuff like that. Uh, I th and I think deep down, I'm, I'm unsure where we'll go, and, and the reason I say that is because I think the AFL are becoming really uh, concerned, and, and regardless of what the coaches say, they are, you're able to do, do that sort of, most of that game, you're able to do it because your players are fitter and stronger than that, but also because you're resting them. And so rotations has led to the fact that they can do that. I do have a little bit of a glimmer of hope. And the reason is that because I said to some people probably about six, seven weeks ago, that if I didn't have to work uh, in the media and go to the game, I wouldn't turn up to an AFL game until three quarter time. Because in the last quarter, we actually see how the game should be played. Because what normally happens in the last quarter, they're getting tired, so they don't run as far. But also the fact normally in the last quarter some side's got to win rather than stop the others. So they tend to hold their structures better. They tend to kick the ball further. They have blokes take the game on and stuff like that. So I think our game can still be done that. But this pressure on to win and the desire to how can we win by firstly really stopping the opposition, um, I think has created an environment um, whereby unless you're very good at it, it looks terrible. <laughs> I mean, I think... I think the Hawthorns and the Geelongs and that can still get away with it and still make the game look okay, but a lot of the other sides are just totally lost. Well, when Clarko took over, they said it was ugly pretty really, didn't they? Yeah. That was first implemented, and then when he took over Hawthorne, everyone said how bad yeah. a style it was, and then yeah. win them the Premiership and yeah. probably set them up. But, yeah, because what, what he's also done is he's smart enough to realise that I better get people who can actually kick the ball sensationally and not give the footy over in that way. Um, but look, things, evolution will come. Um, I think that, uh, see, I, I reckon Sydney's subtly changed. I reckon Sydney's gone from totally defensive now because they've got Franklin and that up the forward line. Uh, they're, they're kicking more into blokes in the forward line than they have in the past in that way. So, but again, you know, who knows? I mean, I'm not, I, I can't foresee the future. I just don't know. But things, what we know is that evolution will occur. I'm just hoping it happens for the better. I can tell you this though, it's an interesting one, um, that the fact that coaches will change dramatically, um, I'll go back um, a few years ago now, uh, it was a period where some coaches 
sorry, some great players were retiring, and uh, we had them and spoke them uh, throughout the last few games of the season. And I said to them, off air, you know, uh, fantastic on your career. Um, have you enjoyed your footy? And there was three of them, and each one of them, the individual, and they all said the same thing. They said, we loved it up until about four years ago. Mm -hmm. I said, why? And they said, because they stopped letting us do the things that we enjoyed. I said, why is that? And they said, it was, they're so paranoid about this other stuff that they've taken away. I said, what are they taking away? They said, they've taken away the thrill of playing on a man, trying to beat him. So there's all good players. Now, two of those three, two became full-time coaches, AFL, one's an assistant coach, and never guess how they're coaching, like they hated, <laughs> because, of the, because of the desire to win in that way. But I thought that was interesting, that these guys just said that they, they really, you know, the thing that they liked when you're growing up was the fact that one thing about our games, you went out and you, you wanted to win the team environment, but you wanted to play on a person, you wanted to do your best to be able to do that. And every one of them hated having to go to the beach. Hated having to go to the beach. I said, well, what would you, well, if you had your choice, what would you do? You go to the forward bar or go to the forward flank. And I said, oh, yeah, of course, because, you know, the only people who are really happy about you going there is the opposition. Go to the bench. Let it wrap if you're off the ground. But sports science tells us that we've got only got so much runness and stuff like that. So anyway, we're off the track. Yep. Uh, these days, coaches and commentators talk a lot about risk and reward, which is in different guises has been the way footy and yep. life business, etc. has gone for years. Um, and footy, well, a lot of things all about confidence, which is what you were talking about before, self-belief. Yep. Um, have you had any success in, with individual players in trying to in lifting them out of their comfort zone to do something different that they haven't done to try and make them a better player? And if you've had success, and can you give a couple of examples, maybe? Yeah. Um, look, I think the thing I think um, I can with. Um, let me give you a case in point. Because I'm, I'm going to go back when I was coaching, we can that way, and I'm going to talk about first guy was a guy called Ozzy Jones. Um, the interesting thing about Ozzy Jones is that Ozzy was passed over in three drafts and and knocked back. Nobody picked him up for three, three drafts, and the reason was because of the fact that um, they said he was too small, and so we picked him up. And by the time we got him, he was so paranoid about making mistakes and was upset about it in that situation. So therefore, what we had with him, we talked about it, but more importantly, his whole thing was, each week, if I went to Austin and said to him, because he now knew this, what's your key today? And his answer was, take them on. And the thing that he knew was that he had to run and bounce. Because that's what he had. But more importantly, if he ran and bounced, got caught, or ran and bounced and mucked it up, the most critical thing was next time he got the ball was to run and bounce. And so therefore we actually changed that from that point of view and he became an outstanding player because we changed that belief system from him in, in that point of view, in that situation. So he's, he's one who readily comes to mind from that point of view. Um, who else can I just come up with? Um, well, I'm going to use one here, um, and, but it wasn't me. Um, it was about, again, um, belief systems of a person. Um, and this person became a real good player only because the players told him what they thought of him. So he changed it. And how it came about was um, middle of winter, um, terrible night, training at Moorabbin, muddy, not worthwhile, so we just trained in the rooms. And then to do something, we just come up with some ideas, had some games, then I got the guys, said, okay, piece of paper, I want you to write down who's the most important player in the club. And so they wrote that down. They gave it to me, and I thought this will be good just to see what happens, have a bit of fun with it. And then I read them all, and I collated them, and there was one person who was way ahead of everybody else, and I said to the playing group, okay, you've had your fun, now I want you to do it properly. And they said, why? I said, well, come on, you know. And they said, this is what we believe. And I said, okay, well, the person who's won it by a mile is Lazar Vidovic. <laughs> now, Lazar Vidovic, six foot nine, Yugoslav, our second ruckman. Now he normally played most of the game off the bench. And so I said to the players, well, come on then, if you said that, why? And I remember one guy said this, 
Well, from my point of view, he's our most important person because when he's in the team, I think we can win. And so I said, why? And they said, because he makes us all walk tall. Because I had a lot of kids. And he was the big tough enforcer. And you know, so I'm looking at him in terms of mark kicks and handballs. And so I said, oh, okay, well, why is that? And, and, and they just said those things to me. So I said to one of my, one of my officials who sat on the bench, I said, did you, did you, do you think they're fair to me? He said, oh, I can tell you what happens. He said, he said, you know, normally doesn't get a run until about the 20 minute mark of the quarter. And you'll phone down and say, put Lays on, Peter Reverett, who's all Australian Ruckman, people, you go down the forward line, Lays, last 10 minutes, just shore them up and stuff like that. And he said, I'll tell you, so often what will happen, as he's about to go, he'll turn to us and say, that number 10's got to go, hasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> and then they said, apparently, just go out and go like, say, you touch those kids again, Noel. And I was most of the day saying, was was him. He, he just went red. You know what? Because he didn't understand how important he was seen by the guys. Well, you should have seen how he blossomed after that. and just changed his whole demeanour in so many ways. So, look, there are, there are probably just a couple who come to mind for different reasons. One, because I think I had direct input, but the other one, because I got totally wrong, but the players told me in, in that situation. Stan, um, you coached uh, St Kilda to the uh, 1997 grand final, I think it was. Yep. Um, do you reflect on that often? and? What would you do differently if you had the opportunity um, to coach them again? I don't reflect on it as much now as I did early days. <laughs> <laughs> um, on the, on the was, I game. tell you what, no, no, yes I do. And, and out of that, there's, um, there are two things that stand out. There's one thing that um, is an element of what I would call, you can't <coughs> help bad luck. Another one is an element of inexperienced coaching. The first element of bad luck is that on the course of leading those finals and we finished on top of the ladder and we would play Adelaide who we played during the year and beaten comfortably twice. We would play Adelaide again next year um, during the home and away games and beat them again. We never met them in the finals next year. So we, we beat them and the only time they beat us was in the grand final. Three weeks out from, we're travelling really well, three weeks out from the finals, my second ruck rover, a bloke called Joel Smith, who worked with Robert Harvey, who was a dead set goal kicker, this kid. This kid kicked goals every week, and, and Harvey would do most of the stuff, but this kid come in, really good player, does a knee, total knee reconstruction, so we lose him. We get into the first final, and we win against Brisbane. During the course of it, our all Australian ruckman, Peter Everett, breaks a collarbone. Bang. Oh, I missed one. Last home and away game, Port Adelaide, Lazar Bitovic, knee reconstruction. Two knee reconstructions and broken collarbone in that way. The week before the grand final, our set up man from, from the back line, our kicking guy, a really great coordinator, Matthew Young, tears a hamstring in that way. Then you have things that just got out of your control. Nicky Winmar, Fantastic player, dad dies in the week. Aboriginal situations, got to go back to Western Australia. He's all over the shop. So we've had those things that have happened to us, and, and that, and, which you just can't do about and that sort of stuff. So that's the bad luck. Where's, the, where's my major problem? My major problem was that during the course of the year, I was so intent on trying to keep my groups together the backs, the forwards and the on balls to create a dynamic environment that what I did do is I played them mostly of the year. Then all of a sudden, I've got two ruckmen gone, I've got a ruck rover gone, and I've got my setup bloke out of the back line gone. Really important players, and I've got to bring in blokes who, guess what, hadn't played in the groups all year. Now, if I look at what would I've done different, if I was half smart, if you see blokes like she at that point of time and Malthouse in his prime and that, what do they always say? You've got to have 28, 29 blokes ready to go any time. What did Sheedy always used to do? During the course of a game, Sheedy would play blokes that nobody expected to play. He'd play a bloke who was centre-half forward and he'd play him centre-half back. You know why? Because he was thinking about the what-ifs. So you know what? I was coaching reactive. 
And so if I'd done something again, I can't do anything about the people missing, but what I would have done is that I would have had other people during the course of the year bringing in, giving them chances and that to be understanding the dynamics. And so, yeah, so I've thought about, I've thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> have you thought about uh, Darren Jarman? <laughs> no, not at all. See, so, yeah, Darren Jarman wasn't our problem. I keep telling people. It's amazing on the outside, Darren Jarman was not the problem. Darren Jarman kicked how many goals? Anybody remember? Five. Five. When did he kick them? Last oh, quarter. No. When did he kick them? He kicked three when the game was over. He kicked three in the last six or seven minutes of the game when it was won. How many goals did Shane Ellen kick? Four. When did he kick them? Three in the first quarter. You know what? We thought of all the options. Have a guess who never thought of Shane Ellen playing full forward because where did he normally play? Fullback. Half back flank. We lost our two ruckmen. We were in front at half time. My ruck coach says to him at half time, we're gone. I said, what do you mean we're gone? He said, our two kids are in. We've got Sirikoski and Cook, six foot three. You want to remember who was rucking for them? Sean Wren. Anybody want to know how Sean Wren went after half time? How do you guess who he was hitting to? McLeod and Cup. How would you like to be jamming, leading up to a bloke giving you the footy like that? <laughs> See, our problem wasn't him, our problem was stopping the supply to him. And that's where, and how it came about, to be honest, is that I can tell you this, again, is you do know these things. 23 minute mark of the last quarter, we were 11 points down. 11 points down, 23 minutes, 7 minutes to go. One of our players, David Sirikoski, takes a mark on the half forward flank near the Melbourne members' side. Goes back and goes like that. Takes his shot. Okay? Just giving a sign. And that sign is, going for the goal, but I'm not really. I'm actually going to kick it 10 metres out to the square that side. That was the whole thing. So everybody just knows. So one of our players is there. They talk amongst each other. They're not. This, this is the person. So as he's coming in, blokes leave everywhere. And they're not our gun players. So our players run out. So guess where, where the opposition go? If it's our gun players. They go up after them. So Siri comes in, beautiful kick, kicks it. It's about 15 metres out from the goal square, so it's about 20 metres out from the goals. He hits it perfectly, and our player is running out to the footy. He's going to take it, he's by himself, and he stops like that. You know what he does? He's slipped over. Now he marks the ball, you hope he kicks a goal, and guess what? You're five points down. But he doesn't. You know who gets the footy? McLeod. McLeod runs the ball, bounces up, has about three bounces, kicks to somebody and run past, gives it, goes bang, who you hit, you hit? Jarman. And all of a sudden, guess what? We're 17 points down, and I look at our guys, three goals, and I saw heads drop. And in those last few minutes, they just, how often have you seen a game jump time? But right at that point in time was a pivotal time. So we're in the thing, and you know, Jarman's kicking his couple of goals, we're doing that little stuff, so I say to my defensive coaches, you know, what do we think we need to do? And they sort of said, can we put so-and-so back and that? And one of the guys said, Nathan Burke, put Burkey back because during the course of the year, he actually played on Jarman and stitched Jarman up and we knew we had him fake. And I said, do you think we should go with it? And one of my other blokes said, coach, we're not playing this game to save it. We've got to win it. We don't get a chance to come back. So we've got to roll the dice. You know, because if you take Burke out, we need Burke in the guts because he's the bloke winning it. So you go with it. Anyway, Burke kicked the goal not long after that, but it didn't matter. So again, yeah, we, you look at those things and, and you've got all your things set up in that situation. But the reality was, for a variety of reasons, we just couldn't we just couldn't bridge the gap and they were better than us on the day. And you've got to wear it. You've got to wear it. So you know, I can sit back and say, if, if luck wasn't this and everything like that, and you know, if I had to play blokes through the year. But guess what? I didn't. <laughs> so I will live with it. Just going back to the comment yep. about the young chap on the train and Paul Popper. Yep. And we have career junior youth coaches. They follow the group through because they're the dad that puts their hand out. But how important is it, and you touched on that versatility, that 
you give every boy a chance to keep going and feel good. Plus, develop players. See, everybody knows who's going to be the full forward for yeah. that. But you want to have that ace up your sleeve yeah. when you go into the match. You come over against a team you know can match you, and you do that. You put your full back full forward. How important is it for the youth and junior coaches to? Really trying to develop the whole team. Well, I think it's. I think that again. Remember, I said from the outset, it's what's your philosophy and who who your group and and what your charter is with those kids. You know, for me, it was it was to make them better players. Was for my charter. So, that, so I'm answering it from that bias point of view, because the bottom line is what I want to look at is that I want to actually give everybody an experience. So it's not only the kid who play in the forward pocket, but what what also about the kid who plays on ball or something like that. Um, am I going to help him become better? Um, what we do know is that the, everybody will tell you at AFL level, and one of the biggest problems today is that when they get the kids, not with all the draft picks, not with all the best midfielders or on ballers, and when they get them, we're going to spend the next three or four years at AFL level teaching them to play defensively because they're all just run, chase the footy type of things. So therefore, if you can give them that experience and help them in those ways. But I think also, if you come back, and from my point of view, to make them better players, um, when we look at them, and I have, I, I just use this kid because again, in my other four years, I use a kid called Chris Whelan. Now, Chris Whelan, for the four years up until I got him, had been best and fairest, not only in him, but in the comp. Now, there's one reason why Chris was the best in the comp. <laughs> and so Chris could just dominate the comp, but you know what? He couldn't kick left foot, he couldn't handball, he didn't have to. Because he just ran down and just knocked them out of the way. But the problem is there will come a time when, you know what, Chris, they'll all catch up to Chris. He was just a little immature. So the challenge from my point of view is that to work with him and just tell him we're going to play him in different positions and what I want to do is that we would be working on other areas of the game to try and help him from that point of view. So I think, again, it's your area of where you see um, and then to be able to sell the kid on the basis because if you're just telling them doing it, but if you say this is what's going to get out of it and lead them along the lines of which we knew those other people, they'll start to grasp it. And I can tell you that I can remember one example. We had a Friday night game. We had a Friday night game under lights. These kids played in it. And what happens that I can remember Chris getting the footy, and it was and we were sort of on the sidelines in the coaching. Chris has got the footy, and he was he was in this position like that, and it's really on his left foot, and he stopped, and he went to come back to get on his right, and he went about there. And he turned around and did a left foot. And he turned to me and went. <laughs> <laughs> so it was just, yeah, so I guess it's, but to me it's important because if you've got these kids, it's, I'm sure if we coach kids, with the wind's okay, but geez, we get a buzz out of seeing kids do other things and developing those other areas to help them on that journey. Yeah. yeah. Challenge those better players to do those things. Yeah. Well, a few people probably got home to go to, haven't you? <laughs> look, um, look, thanks very much. I say this from the outset. I know coming out on a night like this, um, so many other things to do. Um, who's got finals on? Anybody got going into finals? Yes, yeah, so you've got important stuff going on from that point of view. So best wishes to everybody. Um, I'll just finish up by saying, uh, I'm sure you know, but um, I hope you do really appreciate just how important you are. Just how important you are. And I say that because you're the people who are going to give the kids experiences that will determine whether or not they go on. And you can never, you know, I'll come to me, so no worry. And because I'm going to tell you, I, I unashamedly say this to everybody I meet as a coaching ambassador with the AFL and all that sort of stuff, that the reality is that the only reason our game succeeds at the highest level is because people who are down at this level who have got kids giving them good experience and putting them on the journey. That's just how important it is. Sorry, I'm... I was going to say, what do you think of the umpiring at the moment? I'd hate to be an umpire because they've got so many bloody mixed messages. Um, to me, it's just, uh, it just, look, it's a tough game, isn't it? If you start having bloody interpretations and things, to me, I reckon a rule's a rule, and it should be, and this is what it is. But once you get interpretation, and then if you've got three umpires, and you're going to interpret, it can be so different. You know, I, I find that frustrating going to a game, I don't know the players go, because you'll see one umpire will go one way and one will go the other because it's about interpretation in that way. Um, and just to keep mucking around with it, you know, the rules are the rules and if, you know, I, I, I guess these, these when they say like the rolling malls at the moment type of situation, 
I reckon it's about 20 frees happen because they, they're hoping the ball will pop out and the ball pop, and then all of a sudden they'll give up and they'll just ball it up and then, then somebody in frustration, you almost sort of say, they'll give a free now. <laughs> you just know. So I, I think it's tough on the umpires. I think it's a tough job, but they've just made it so, so hard because they just keep tinkering, from my point of view, with the, with the interpretation of the rules. We have Hyde of Tasmania, Alex of Tasmania and also in your single group here tonight. Thank you very much for your contributions, Ken. Um, great to have that insight and in, in strategies and mechanisms around leadership, but I think more importantly, the challenging the issue to us to improve leadership within our teams. It'll be really interesting in a few years' time to see Robbie's under eights as to you know, what they can do with Adam Jones at under 12s in, in two years' time, probably, with just how much better they can be the yeah. And, I, and I'll just that say that. again is that I've, I've done a pretty complex thing here tonight. But with underage kids and stuff like that, you don't have to worry about that whole thing. I mean, the first start would be just before every drill, asking kids what do you think is important, and then getting them to say it, and then do that little review now and again, or giving somebody else a chance, because then all of a sudden you start to open them up, um, and then you can get down to the sophisticated thing, but to just sell that uh, image. And I think the other thing is that you sometimes you find out that the kids actually know a little bit more than you thought, and it's a very pleasant surprise. So once again, Nick, thank, thank you very, very much. much.